okay? So, we have heard some thoughts about theory. Let's put this into practice, right? That's the most important thing there is. And uh, so, for example, I've uh, recently, with, uh, with a good student, I've done uh, some, some interesting measurements, um, weight, weight measurements with polarized electrodes. Um, as uh, someone here already reminded me, is that actually, it's really funny, we started this work and afterwards I discovered that actually a patent has been granted. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, so it's, it's, that, that's the way it goes, right? So um, 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 I um, kind of think the idea in this pattern is also the following, that if you electrically polarize an electrode, so an electrode is, um, for example, it's a wax, okay, which is dipolar, and you, um, you make it a liquid, and you apply an electric field, you put it between two plates, you make an electric field, so the molecules, right, they, they change orientation, right, they align, and then uh, in this state, you cool it down. So you have a permanent kind of electric uh, uh, polarization inside this material, okay? Now, it slowly degrades over time, yeah? So it's not like a permanent magnet which stays there for years, an electrode has some kind of degradation, but fair enough. Actually, this kind of uh, uh, electrode was invented by a Japanese, I think, in the 1920s. <laughs> and it's still the same formula being used today, so there's not been much progress. And it's also, you can't buy electrodes, actually. So look for electrodes to buy. They're only used, actually, as a foil in electrode uh, microphones. So that's the application there. Still, this, this foil also is, I haven't found this really on sale. And every, every time I ask someone, uh, do you know a source where I can get an electrode? They said to me, well, guess you have to make it yourself. <laughs> so we became busy. And, uh, hmm? Yeah, 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 it's kind of a thing. But you can imagine uh, us uh, in the lab, yeah, uh, having here this little uh, 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 heater, right? And then we, we get some chemicals together, right? And we started to cook. <laughs> yes, and she said, it's like breaking bad. Yeah. But <laughs> let's make some electrodes, right? So, okay. We, we, we really tried. We did. And, um, and of course, uh, well, in the patent, uh, uh, Ron Kitter uh, just describes kind of verbally that uh, he has seen that there was a huge effect and then it, uh, there was a kind of a reversal of the effect after one month or so, uh, but without any graphs and whatever. Well, we put this into test and, as usual, it takes at least a year <laughs> to understand your test setup, right? We have seen great effects, but uh, we were very critical of ourselves and we very soon realized that just cannot be true. Um, so um, the way, for example, also we did it first was um, to have our uh, electrode being prepared uh, in a very thin polyethylene container. Yeah. So very thin, the polyethylene has the same di dielectric constant as the wax itself, so that was for matching. Uh, however, uh, every plastic has some permeability for a gas. Okay, so we suspected there is for sure some exchange here with the environment. So we try to limit that with various techniques, yeah? You cannot imagine, I mean, for sure we did 20 variations of the theme, yeah? Always trying to make it to seal better, better sealing and whatever. And uh, we really discussed going to lunch every day. That's not possible, I mean, we cannot make a better seal, right? And we always saw this kind of drifts. But over time, over a year or so, it always got smaller, 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 the better we got. And then the, the best seal we found so far was this little bottle from the local <laughs> supermarket. You can imagine what was inside. And, <laughs> and <laughs> we transformed it into an electrode. And um, um, so, so we had then here just a metal cap. And uh, so uh, every kind of kind of epoxy, seal or whatever, it's all permeable yeah, for, for gas. So it's, I mean, th that's really a headache. Yeah? So we said, okay, the smallest thing you can do is we have this out of glass with the metal cap and then just around there, very thin layer, I mean, it's all pressed in, very thin layer of, uh, of epoxy uh, to, to completely seal it off. That gave the smallest effect. Still, there is an effect. And uh, um, kind of it looks, for example, something like that, that you can see that, uh, um, well, first, uh, usually it starts to dip down, then it goes up, 
And uh, in that case, it's kind of stable. Sometimes there's still a kind of a drift. We have some instrumentation uh, to measure the electric field in parallel, whatever what it is doing. Uh, we're still very skeptical, of course, of whatever we're seeing. I had a paper at the JPC just some weeks ago, actually. And um, so you can read it up, uh, everything that, that we did there. And uh, we still believe that we have to make better uh, seals and also to characterize the drift of our balance still much, much better. Originally, I wanted to do a vacuum experiment because then there is no air, right? However, there's lots of outgassing, <laughs> okay? And that can also have drift, so it's really a nightmare because I'm talking here about something you see very, very small, okay? Kind of one, two milligrams. This is really small, yeah? So in a pattern, I think there were claims of hundreds of milligrams, yeah? Well, but, but there is maybe something on the milligram range to be explored. So uh, still, uh, yeah, we are just getting ready for the next uh, test campaign there. Okay, then let's go from electrostatic energy and uh, wave electrodynamics and so on. Let's go to, to uh, Mach effect thrusters. Huh? So, um, well, we all know the scheme, so there is, uh, there is nothing new here. Um, every time I saw Jim's derivation and so on, it, it, there are a lot of steps. I mean, we, we discussed this already. I tried to find, for me, a very simple way of how to understand it, of how to, to get uh, to this conclusion. This is actually very similar to actually what Lance uh, did, so, so we learned about this. Maybe I'm not going through this derivation here. Uh, just um, kind of to tell you that I kind of also convinced myself that this effect that Jim is talking about is actually indeed just a consequence of general relativity theory. So there is nothing really, there is no big assumption here. It's all actually really embedded in general relativity theory. So if you do a kind of linearization approach of general relativity, that's how you show you know that um, the, the typical laws like uh, uh, Newton's uh, law of gravity uh, or frame dragging, this kind of stuff, this is all embedded in general relativity. You do this with linearization. So you're saying, oh, I'm not going with the speed of light and no black hole in the neighborhood. Yeah? And uh, so you use this and the equations become a little bit more simple. Okay? And usually you end up with Newton's force law if you neglect time dependent terms. Because that's a big thing. Oh, we're only looking at static fields, so that's okay. Thing is, indeed, if you say, well, but let's consider time-dependent terms, then indeed you get exactly the components that Jim has actually derived many, many years ago. So I convinced myself that there should be something. It's inside general relativity, and that's well, that's what there is. Yep. That. So we agree uh, that type of equation. You get the field equation yep. from general relativity. Yep. But. Jim has another ensemble on top of that. That's here. Check out the fourth ensemble. So that's not in general relativity. That's you know your intuition. Oh, or yeah, because you're talking about the actual mechanical position. Where you're adding a second ensemble on top of that. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's just an additional force. Thank you, Carl. Or in other words, it's just engineering. <laughs> <laughs> We know how to make this, uh, how to put this really into practice. So that's the theory, how to put this into practice. And uh, well, let's say, so the principle here was detected some 20 years ago. And uh, uh, thrust is uh, so quite low. And uh, so um, uh, what I've seen as a kind of a missing thing for me here uh, was not only the tests for me were missing in really high vacuum. So um, I think your tests were done with roughing pumps so far, right? So uh, high vacuum uh, was an issue here for me. and. And especially because that's also what I've seen from my EM drive tests and so on, that better put all the electronics on the balance. So, so yeah, that's a very good idea, right? Yeah, very good idea. So uh, that's, that's actually uh, my approach here. So um, um, actually, <laughs> Jim gave me a thrust in 1999. <laughs> so, and uh, I promise to you that uh, I'm tr I will try all my best to test it. And in fact, I keep my promise. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's 1999 yeah, version, that's, so that's the old leader job. Very, very old. Yeah. So you will see. Very <laughs> careful. I'm easy to write. I'm, I'm very careful. <laughs> well, I am, but okay. Well, my two students, they they try their best. They they try their best. I hope so. Um, anyway, so um, that's uh, Jim's original thruster here, and um, so we really spent kind of a year to put uh, this kind of electronics in a very compact way uh, on a balance uh, with all the problems uh, uh, that you cannot use electrolyte capacitors and this kind of stuff. Um, um, and well, originally we thought we can do it with a digital amplifier that has a very high uh, efficiency. Um, however, uh, at these high frequencies, it's just not possible, it doesn't work. So we are also using analog amplifiers, pre-amplifier, analog amplifier, but in very compact way, uh, still efficient enough uh, to work with it uh, uh, actually here in vacuum. I have a pretty large vacuum chamber compared to what we have seen so far. So my vacuum chamber where I could do the test is about 1.5 cubic meters. So that's, that's, and you have a 700 liters pump, I have a 2,300 liters pump. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yes, little competition here, right? So, um, okay. Um, and um, so we have our own uh, also wave form generator. So a microprocessor, which is doing all the job in a digital way, all on the balance. Well, of course, the application will be to bring this into orbit once, right? So better get started soon, how to bring this stuff uh, together. And uh, well, we try to make really very good shielding. So we have a big box out of uh, magnetic permeable uh, material. So not just really big boxes all around the frosted the electronics and so on. You will see pictures quite soon. Um, we do usually kind of 20 profiles testing over each run and then do some data averaging, not only to get the noise time, but to see if it's repeatable. Yes. Martin, treat this as an RF system, not as an analog uh, audio system. Yep. You need to have a dual directional coupler between your RF source and the test starter. You need to look at reflected power and you need to use the, uh, uh, the minimum VSWR tracker for your frequency tracker with an artificial offset plus or minus. That would be of course the ideal way. <laughs> and that's hopefully what we can try to implement next year. I think we discussed these lessons learned already, right? That you should track the frequency and adapt it and so on. For sure, that's something that has to be done. So I have already some ideas on this too. <laughs> yeah, so because we have everything there already in a digital setup, so that works quite well. Um, yeah, we are testing with uh, 35 kilohertz plus the 70 kilohertz on top of it, so the usual thing. Um, also, we have seen that fortunately, also in high vacuum, our amplifier stays at below 65 degrees, which is okay, yeah, not that uh, it burns up. Um, we have kind of 90 volts, um, the power output, so not the input, but the output, yes? Okay, uh, you say the usual thing, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the usual thing for Heidi is the natural frequency, in this case it would be 35 kilohertz. Nothing going on at 70 kilohertz. The, 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 two, the two omegas is purely a function of the electrostriction effect, which is actually has a resonance at half the frequency. So that would be a resonance at 17. It, it's, it's more complicated in this case, Jose, because the thruster that he is checking is not like the ones that Heidi and I are running now. Oh, so that matter, 
by George or Henry. Those are all built on the basis of Steiner Martin's 111 material, oh. which has the electrostriction. The one that Martin has has Edo DC 65 material discs in it, and I don't know that it has the electrostricted response oh. that's necessary. That's so why Martin's using the second harmonic signal. So, so what, what material are you using? It's, it's the EDO, I think you described it in your book quite well. EDO 65. It's, it's the soft stuff, isn't it, Jim? It's very high dielectric constant. Yeah, it's soft. Oh. It's about 5,000 dielectric constant. And a low quali uh, mechanical quality thing. Very low. It's about 4% dissipation. Wow. Yeah, so very, I, I would it's say... It's not the stuff that you want to build these I, I would say quite different. Yeah. yeah. Different I mean, material, different, different <laughs> excitation, yes. I built them out of that because I had them. <laughs> <laughs> they were cheap. They were cheap. They were gift. So. I think it's also a very good experience just for us to get the test set up again, right? Took another year again to, to get all the electronics in, so in such a way that it doesn't interfere with the measurement and whatever. So whatever we have, we can only get better in the next uh, generation, hopefully. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, Martin, if you're interested in working in sort of a loose consortium, you know, we'll be happy to provide you with devices that have known performance and all that. And you can that would be great. So Stevens, for sure, would appreciate. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yep. So um, um, yeah, I have that in place, um, and uh, yeah, the test I'm going to show you now, actually from this weekend. And <laughs> so please, please bear in mind. I really made him really work very hard. They worked weekends and whatever to get this all done um, because I wanted to share this here with Jim. <laughs> What, what we did. So please remember, it's really preliminary, okay? Uh, uh, I haven't done anything with this data yet and I still need to convince myself of, so, okay, it's all preliminary, but we're here to share, right? So that's my thing, so I don't hide anything, so I just share, huh? Okay, so my torsion balance, I think it's the fifth generation <laughs> that I'm working on right now, so many lessons learned. Um, and um, my balance here can now support up to 25 kilograms of weight for a thruster and 25 of kilograms for the electronics. So it's really a big thing. Yeah? And uh, not only that I can have all these electronics here on board, um, I even have, in order to even get rid of these Gallinstein contacts, I have infrared wireless communication uh, to communicate with the electronics on board and so on. So this is uh, really well done. Um, I have all sorts of onboard electronics. Um, I have uh, thermocouple readouts, the whole data acquisition card, everything on the balance, on the balance. So that's really very handy. Uh, um, uh, right, I have various kinds of damping. So we have from magnetic damping to fluid damping. Yeah? So there are lots of options. Um, of course, uh, everyone started to use this electrostatic comp calibration. This was done first from the University of Southern California, Andrew Katzdeva. I copied it, everyone copied it, <laughs> right? Uh, however, uh, we found out that there is even a better way of calibrating it with um, very highly miniaturized voice coils. Because with that uh, calibration technique, I can give uh, thrusts in either directions. I can make a positive or a negative one, so I can convince myself all directions. And it has a very high response and so on, so I can check fast pulses. So we do uh, lots of uh, calibration things, and uh, students calibrate our techniques very similar to what you said uh, on, a, on a commercial balance, which is calibrated to check that whatever voltage we feed in in the coil corresponds to, that's what everyone does. But so, so I think that our calibration, well, I think I know it's uh, accurate to 0.8%. Uh, uh, um, so so that's, that's not so bad. Um, um, and uh, there is another twist here that um, I used uh, the FieldTech uh, interferometric sensor myself for many, many years, but of course, there's something much better. <laughs> it's also much more expensive. But anyway, I'm very happy that I have this. I have the world's best commercial available interferometric sensor here with a resolution of 10 picometers. So I can see everything. <laughs> That's, I think so. So subatomic distances, it's not so bad. And um, 
and <laughs> I think so. And uh, so, so still, with this big monster, with all its capabilities, I have a thrust noise which is, yeah, now yeah, below 50 uh, nanonewtons, and I can easily go down because I have this super resolution. Just depending on how, mu how much I average, I can go down really very well. And um, so that's uh, actually how it looks like. So that's our big chamber uh, with the with the balance here inside. Uh, the wireless uh, infrared communication here. Um, um, yeah, we have some really sophisticated software, not only to control the balance, but especially also for the data processing. So I can get all the profiles out, uh, I can do a drift analysis, uh, I can take out uh, trends or drifts, um, I can do the data averaging, everything online here, and uh, this is really very helpful. Um, here you can see just some examples here of the noise where you see that we are here in the, yeah, the peaks are plus or minus uh, 50 uh, nanonewtons, yeah, very low drift, uh, calibration values. We have automatic calibration before each measurement, so we had, there are several steps being taken, you check for linearity, all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, yeah, that's the more messy setup, it's including everything for the Mach effect for us. Huh? So actually here we have our signal generator uh, just here in the back. We have here our power amplifier. You see that the power amplifier as well as also uh, Jim's thruster have K thermocouples where we measure always the temperature with it. Um, yeah, here's the infrared communication here. Um, well, that's the scheme, that's, that's the mix of the frequencies that we're using. Um, and again, it's all, it's all inside the balance, so you just have a 24 volts input and everything is done on a balance with DC-DC converters for everything what we need, digital control, that's all implemented. Uh, here you see the 1999 <laughs> frost, thanks again, and uh, here it sits with the thermocouple that we put in here. Um, and yeah, it's in a big box, which is completely then shielded off, and uh, here it's inside, and uh, off it goes. Uh, is this battery powered? Uh, nope. Um, well, it can be battery powered, but in that case, uh, so we, we, we have uh, also these two uh, flexural bearings, right? So, and we supply the plus uh, and, the, and, the, and the minus uh, via these two uh, bearings. So not with cables, but we use the bearings as electric conductors. So there is no cabling here involved. Hmm? Isn't this uh, uh, fitting of the current for the bearings uh, embracing the large operation? Nope. nope, not at all. Okay. Oh yeah, we, 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 <laughs> we can run, well we run more than six amps through this bearing without any influence, so I guess <laughs> this should be safe. Um, and and they're, they're really quite big for this. Okay, so now comes uh, the graph. Uh, again, tests from this weekend. Yeah? So. Um, that's what we've seen. So you see, first of all, the resolution here is excellent. So you were talking about some micronewtons, and as I said, I think we can really see everything. That's forward and backwards, and uh, you notice that there is a difference here in the order of magnitude from the thrust. So I just go then to the next picture, is if we subtract forward and backwards, then th this is what you get. So about one micronewton, and with this jerk, <laughs> at the beginning and at the end. I think this is very similar to, to what, what you are seeing and, 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 and what, what other people are seeing. So we can, we can, I think we can see this too with very high resolution. But um, of course, uh, again, as I said, uh, first measurements here. And I really want to know this heating issue. And uh, um, I'm sure I can make much better because I want to see the thrust really in one direction, the other one getting rid here of all these thermal drift effects. So that's the next thing that uh, actually here we have to do. The x-axis is time? That's time, yes, sorry. That's time here. That's the force. And uh, so what's the, what do you, you guys probably all already covered this. What's the time lag between when you apply the power and when you start to see a difference in the thrust trace? There's like a three second five second time. Right, uh, what I plotted here, actually I did this yesterday night, this is the commanded uh, impulse and not the measured impulse then, okay. that is really going out of the, uh, so I don't have all the data here with okay. me. Right. So there's <laughs> some latency. Yeah, there's some latency, I, I have right. to correct all that. That's what I'm saying, right. just sharing the data as it is right now. But um, yeah, to me it looks pretty interesting. So, and uh, yeah, I think it's the first measurement of a self, Sustained system, right? With the power of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Many thanks to my student on record. Yeah, um, yeah. It's really with amplifying everything. 
on the balance. So I think that takes out also some concern mm -hmm. that there was. So, so was, um, I would assume that along with the thruster probably came some sort of analytical prediction of what forces might come out of that. So does this match anything? <laughs> 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 it's really a long time ago, but I keep my promise. But Janet, it's, it's a, one for your 2012 JPC paper, make some thrust predictions. So you know about this uh, for this type of this class. Yeah, it's in his book. Is his book? Yeah. That's why I was asking. Does this match any kind of prediction? We expected something in the micro newton or sub micro newton range. So. That's the very so first measurement. It's an entirely different design. Okay. And it shows the characteristics, which are the switching transients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, sure does. And tomorrow I'll show you what switching transients look like when you switch DC. Mm -hmm. That is to say they're over there. So it has to be AC signal that's switched um, to do so. Okay. So. Okay, <laughs> sure, you're welcome. So now we're ready for the M drive, right? <laughs> okay. Mark, put in an order for a 1500 Newton thruster, please. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm taking orders after the talk, right? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. So, EM drive, I mean, we have very similar pictures and so on. I mean, I had the same picture here uh, as yeah. you. Um, and again, uh, it's really um, that um, I came across this because my students said, hey, everyone talks about this, the media is full of this. Um, <laughs> I don't believe in any uh, news articles <laughs> myself, really, especially when you are cited yourself and you never gave an interview there. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, really incredible. But anyway, so, um, uh, um, so I, uh, I really met Roger Scheuer and, uh, um, and uh, discussed this over with him four hours or so. Um, and, uh, and I really have to say, I mean, for sure, this guy knows at least experimentally what he's talking about. So he has been for 30 years a microwave payload specialist at Astrium, now Airbus Defense and Space. So he, he knows about the microwave business very well. So I said, okay, well, for me, I mean, all these theories, I mean, I know, <laughs> I mean, we could talk a lot about this, yeah, but if it's the Q thruster theory or is it Maxwell plus some extension, or whatever, I don't care. I am only interested in experimental case. I think there is, we are not that far yet to make here any claim on what's the theory to explain it. And I think it's all, uh, my personal experience, it makes a much better case that you don't lose any kind of credibility by just concentrating on an experimental case um, without, uh, um, yeah, because, you know, if, if, you, if you say, oh, it exactly matches my theory, and if someone finds a flaw in your theory, everyone will question your experimental result as well. So just keep this out of the game and just concentrate on an experimental thing. Try to have, as, as I think you are doing, you just take one thrust and try to analyze it to the death, right? So then if, if it survives, the game is on, <laughs> okay? And there will be hundreds of physicists thinking about theories and whatever, yeah? Uh, focus on this one and try to, to convince yourself if it's working. And uh, to me, the most convincing thing here was um, also what, uh, what, uh, what you've shown, uh, that it was kind of a torsion uh, balance yeah, test. And, and I said, well, uh, um, if um, the, the biggest suspicion was it's kind of air driven, right? There is some air leaking or hot air and it's moving. Well, to move that stuff, I mean, you would feel the wind <laughs> next to it if it's doing this turn around, yeah? So I said, well, that, that can't be. So that was, for me, the most convincing thing uh, to really investigate if there is something or not. Considering that was a 100 kilogram test article, oh, yeah. there's a lot of yeah. things to move. There, there should be, you know, you can, uh, yeah, sure. it's, it's kind of an air conditioning unit. So <laughs> you, should, you should really feel it, okay? So I said, that, that's a pretty good test. And uh, actually, it started out with, uh, by talking to Roger Scheuer, he said, well, first, um, he put it on a, on a scale and measured, yeah, by looking up and looking down, he, he checked uh, if there was a difference in weight, and then he can, he can know what's the thrust. 
And uh, my first question was, yeah, buoyancy and this kind of stuff. He said he has taken this to account, but the test results were published, I think, some two weeks ago. So uh, when, when I talked to him, he couldn't give me any details here. But I said, okay, well, that's a good starting point. I should probably repeat both. I should check his original thing, how he measured thrust, mm -hmm. and then put this on a torsion balance to convince myself if there is something here or if there is not. And okay, well, there's the video. And uh, yeah, I mean, to move this stuff, <laughs> well, yeah, you should feel a wind if there is a wind. So um, true. Um, then, of course, uh, there was your work. And uh, um, that was uh, really starting to get interesting. For ex especially look at the following characteristic. Yeah? So it's going up. While it's thrusting, it's increasing, okay? Then it's going down not to the same zero line. That's a very important thing to remember also for my uh, thrust measurements, okay? So, so that's, that's, uh, that's how you did it. And uh, yeah, looking back and forth, that's also a very good thing. And at the time, there was just a rumor that you did a vacuum test, and you did it already. So, but I said, yeah, if I do it, I really want to do it in vacuum here myself. So we also did console simulations to check, and uh, we, were very, we were very lucky because, uh, uh, so we sent this also to Roger Shoya to exchange, is this design the correct way to do it, to give some, some, some really insights here, and that's our <laughs> cheap version of building the EM drive. Um, first of all, you will see that um, the EM drive that we did, we made out of a solid <laughs> in order to, <laughs> yeah, avoid many issues they are, to make it really as sleek tight as possible. And uh, um, yeah, it was just uh, for us the way to go. And here you can see uh, the commercial magnetron that we got out of a 50 bucks uh, microwave oven from the locals, uh, 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 yeah, consumer market. So <laughs> yeah, we, we, we bought several of them <laughs> in the course of this. Everyone was wondering, what are you doing with all these microwaves? Well, we're just interested in the magnetron. We don't care about anything else. So we have a few spare microwaves without the, the, the magnetron. Uh, at my lab, if anyone is interested here in some spare parts. So, um, yeah. So that also means that we have an input power of 700 watts, uh, and we are fixed with the frequency, and the way uh, we tried to adapt uh, to get a good Q factor, please remember, uh, uh, so I'm a physicist, my students are aerospace engineers, we have not a clue about uh, radio frequency stuff and so on, right? So we try to have a very simple approach and how to, how to optimize this. And um, uh, kind of, uh, we had this approach here where we can vary the top part, we can move it up and down uh, to get a nice Q factor and then seal it off. So that was our thing. Knowing that when we, it's being heated up, it will change its characteristics and so on, but that's the best thing that uh, we could do here at this time. And then when we had everything here, where the Q factor, please don't laugh, of 50, yeah, which was, well, <laughs> okay, first time, first build, okay? So, uh, and, uh, because we are fixed with the frequency. We knew that there's a much better Q factor somewhere else, but we just, we just couldn't tune it that way. So this was the 50 bucks, um, yeah, Magnetron. Okay. Um, so first thing I said, okay, let's put this also here into uh, 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 so on a on a on a balance uh, to check uh, if there's kind of to do this weight trick, looking up, uh, looking down, and uh, yeah, we went. Uh, to the local Home Depot and got some spare parts to, to, to then test for putting some thermal shielding around. Yeah? Um, and uh, then um, we, we also tried, um, in order to, to remove any kind of magnetic effects here, uh, or at least reduce it uh, to have some, some soft iron yeah, that would we put all around to shield it here as well. And uh, because we have seen when we powered it up that, uh, well, there was already a big effect just from the heating up here, uh, then um, you know, air can move here inside. So we stuffed up the whole inside here with just thermal isolation material that there is no air that can circulate around here to the best of our ability. And kind of that's then the best uh, that, that we could find. Yeah? So basically we were firing up here. So yeah, you go up, whoop, and when it's on, it goes up, 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 up. So very similar to you. And then it stops. And, and then it slowly goes down. So this goes down much more slowly because you have to imagine this big, big box where we heat up everything and so on, and it's 700 watts and not, not the kind of power that you were using. So this thermal effect here was really significant. Still, um, I mean, we did this to the best uh, we could. Um, so this was up, this was down, 
Um, and then um, I also, uh, not only up and down, then I pointed it in that direction, which should not produce any thrust, and well, that's our thermal thing here. So there may still be here some, some, some thermal issue. I mean, we, we see this from, from this effect here for sure, but from the prediction there was, uh, it was that it should make uh, uh, 100 micronewtons with the 700 watts of our Q factor, and up and down together, that's about 230 micronewtons, that's not bad, that's exactly what was expected. But we said, okay, well, so far, so good, but uh, <laughs> uh, I have to, yeah. Just before you leave that one. Sure. You're saying that the extension of the thrust all the way through the 350 seconds mm -hmm. is because it's thermal, it didn't fall off? It, it, it falls off uh, uh, slowly, very slowly. Yeah. The baseline so, on his torque, on his leg scale shifted with the thermal. Yeah. Because the thermal it makes it expand, yeah. so you get a CG shift, and then it's expressed in the deflection of his baseband. Okay. Yeah, so you have to wait half an hour or so when it's really cool. Half then an it goes back to hour, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then you go back to zero, and you can start the whole thing again. So we tested this again with, I think, well, 38 tests in every direction, okay? So I'm always trying not to do one test, but many, many tests, right, to, to get things from a basis. But that looked quite interesting that it depended on the thrust direction, so to say. So that was the first step here. But I said, well, we have to go on a torsion balance because then the buoyancy effect will be much less. And uh, please, in vacuum, because then I don't care about buoyancy at all anymore, right? So that was the plan. So we have our little facility here, of course, a little or big facility. And uh, this was uh, now kind of now kind of two years ago. So uh, um, not uh, uh, the setup that I just presented you for the Mach effect thruster, but, uh, but quite similar. And uh, right, this was the first test that we did in high vacuum. And um, actually we, we checked. So there is, um, uh, there is a critical voltage kind of um, the magnetron, when, when um, there's a critical voltage where it's turning on, okay? So, um, so we were, you know, 50 volts, 100 volts and so on. There's a critical voltage where it starts to turn on the magnetron. So we could see this here very well also. So when we were powering up the thruster, then uh, kind of, yeah, we were seeing, well, similar thing again. So going up and then during, during the period here, I mean, we were firing up for, you see, 20 seconds. Yeah, so quite some time, and the thrust going up, 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 and then we stop going down here, and then also it's, it slowly goes back. Yeah? Maybe also due to the fact that uh, we didn't have this thin copper foil that you have, but we had massive copper. Yeah. So anyway, so that uh, was my student's choice. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and he polished it very well. That's why I ask you for if you polished it. Oh my God, three days only polishing. So again, uh, why is the force uh, uh, increasing from uh, 15 seconds up to uh, 40 seconds? Well, um, I believe in this case, it's very similar to what we've uh, discussed uh, also here before, that there is a shift in the center of gravity because the whole stuff right. just... So it's, it's, an, it's an artifact it's of... It's an artifact. Thing. Yes, it is. That's because when I stop, <laughs> it's there and, and it takes time to go down. So, so that's, we know, yeah? That's, that's the thing and that's what you, that's the next year that you have to work on to reduce this stuff. This is this thermal signature here. Um, but, but anyway, uh, so this, um, this was, at least we could say that air for sure is not the cause of this effect. That's, that's what we could say here. Is that showing yeah. though that there's thrust after the power is turned off? Well, well, thrust. <laughs> that's now the new zero position of the balance. Yeah, there's displacement. The the that's now the zero position of the balance. Yep. Yeah, well, it says it's force. Uh, um, yes. Because, because you have, it's a torsion balance, yeah. so deflection is being calculated into force. Right? You're saying there's no thrust, no force when the power is There's off. no, no, no power supplied, no, no thrust, so to say. So when you see Tony, you have a prompt at uh, price points, okay? Mm -hmm. Between, uh, let's say, 15 and 20 seconds. Yeah. But then when you switch it off, shouldn't it <coughs> go down? relatively fast and then start to, live, to uh, drift again. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, you see here a little dip here. Yeah, yeah right. Here, okay. Isn't this too small? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, the, thing is, uh, the thing is, first of all, that um, um, from the magnetron, when you turn it on, it actually takes some time until whoop, 
Th there's actually some process. It's not going instantly when you supply power to a magnetron. There's some time delay in it where it ramps, ramps up. So that, that's what I can understand. Yeah, no, there's another cause, too. Oh, there, Michelle, before <coughs> yeah. On your magnetron, when you turn your magnetron on, it's like a tube. You have a heater inside the tube. Right. And the first thing you do is, is heat up the heater on it so you can supply electrons into the tube. And it takes about three to five seconds for that to happen. So you've got a delay before that heater starts supplying the electrons from the tube. So okay. the tube you So you mean the, the first part of the cluster is a thermal effect as well? Because it's heating up and you are seeing uh, a... That's why there is a little delay here of uh, two seconds or so. Yeah, there's also another element going on. Mm -hmm. The magnetron, as the, the fins in the magnetron starts, you know, the electron bunches start spinning around. Mm -hmm. They heat up and they expand. So the average frequency band that's 20 to 30 megahertz mm -hmm. wide is going to drift yes. up to a megahertz. Yeah. And if it's not, if your resonant frequency of your cavity yeah. is not in that band, or it's in the band and then out of the band, you're going to see a thrust peak, and then, and it looks thermal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, the magnetrons, the magnetrons, they will try to lock, mode lock, within whatever cavity you're trying to do. That's it. that's the nature of the, and you can also see those effects on the, on the. Uh, the lines that you have there too. Mm -hmm. So there's several effects going on. Magnetrons are not the best things to be using. I know. <laughs> I know. Do not strap, so, do so. Not strap the magnetrons onto sure. the thrust drum. No. Do not do that. That's sure. a bad bad. Um, but exactly what Nembo was saying, uh, um, um, I, I, I thought um, that, that could be a problem, and uh, at least air here, we can rule out that that is a cause for, for, uh, for the effect. But I was very curious um, about my electric connection going uh, to the magnetron. So um, that's why also I ask you what kind of effects you have seen with the gallon stand, because I used the liquid metal contacts to get the power uh, to the magnetron here. And uh, uh, well, we have seen also some heating up of the gallon stand and so on, so some nasty effects. Your work run at 700 watts, so that's yeah. about a, a kilowatt of yeah. power through the gallon stand yeah. contact. Yeah. I'm only doing about 200 to 300 sure. watts. Sure. So I really suspect it because also when I, uh, I use coax cables, of course, all the time, yeah, but if I changed uh, some direction of the cabling, okay, I, I could see that, uh, that some thrust values, you know, varied a bit here and there. So I thought, well, there is for sure some interaction here uh, with, uh, with the cabling. And especially we have seen that there was some uh, interaction uh, with the thruster and the magnetic damping in that case. 700 watts again, it was really big. Um, and uh, so in the next uh, thing, um, I said, I want to remove this, um, this magnetic damping here and uh, just go for fluid damping. Um, how we do fluid damping right now is using a uh, gallon stand yeah, for fluid <laughs> damping, which is very handy. Uh, but uh, because, uh, well, how, well, students, you know, we test through the night and whatever, and then we just need to test out a new idea. You don't get gallon stand in the next supermarket, but, but you can get uh, oil in the next supermarket. So, so please, <laughs> we just need some oil. <laughs> yeah, it's not vacuum compatible, I know. But uh, I don't care about air influence anymore, so I can do the test on air, but I can replace the magnet damping with fluid damping. That was the case here. So this was our oil from a supermarket uh, damping here. Um, and um, here you can see the complete EM drive with the magnetron, everything here on. Um, and um, that's then what we did. Uh, of course, the damping uh, was not as effective as with the magnet. So you can see uh, the stuff here. But this was then the first time where I've seen that when I have thrust in this direction or thrust in that direction, that actually it really indeed flipped sign. So that I have a positive thrust and a negative thrust without worrying so much about these thermal drifts. So I was kind of happy with that graph, but of course trying to <laughs> find out the real cause, we said, okay, now let's not only this and that, but, uh, but what about this orientation over there? Yeah? 
And uh, unfortunately, this orientation over there gave a very similar value as, um, as the value here for the positive thrust. So I said, the only thing I can say is that I kind of reached the level of resolution of my measurement here. And I cannot say it's right or wrong. So I kept a very safe uh, uh, kind of ending there uh, on the paper. Um, however, um, you have to know that um, when I have here the M drive, okay, and the magnetron is there, uh, when, I, when I change the orientation, I mean, there can be that there is still some EM drive also, you know, coming from that the magnetron actually, it's not in the center line, but, but it's, it's, it's in a completely different direction. So, so that, that, that can give a thrust contribution in, in another direction as what we have thought originally. So that can very well be. The only thing is that, of course, from these measurements, it was just not, uh, uh, there was uh, not enough confidence level. So this was, again, the first time we tested this stuff and we hope to test it in a much, much better way with all this learning curve experience next year. So that's what we are trying to do. And uh, lots of things on the list, <laughs> what we can do. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, especially these things, I think it's just an excellent university project uh, because we can only learn and we can learn uh, you know, all these mistakes that we try to find and every little factor that improves our measurement, that's, that's incredible knowledge. And the students understand that measurement and thrust and whatever in a much, much better way. So I think something like the M drive, it's just a perfect education project. That's, that's how I really put it. So we can only learn. And if some other people say, oh, no, well, it's valid, it's conservation, don't, don't test it, whatever. Say, Even better, <laughs> you know, I, I test something which theoretically should not work. So let's try to get the best measurement done ever yeah, to make sure if it stays or if it doesn't. So I think it's the best education project you can think of. So maybe some of you would like to join me sometimes in Dresden. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>- my, my null measurement, right? When I said, okay, I've, I've now this direction, this direction, and now I'm going this direction. And this gave a very similar thrust value to this direction. So when the null measurement gives the same direction as the positive thrust direction, that just means that I reached the level of, uh, of resolution in my measurement. So I cannot then say for sure that what I've seen is really, is real thrust, yeah? Because my null measurement had thrust. Are you planning on next year, when you're doing this next test, are you planning on changing the thrust term that you're using? <laughs> sure. <laughs> For sure. What are you planning on, on building oh. this time? <laughs> Actually, that's also one of the reasons why I came to this conference, <laughs> to talk to, uh, to others, uh, right, uh, to get some insights if it's a good idea or a bad idea. We have to learn from each other. We have to, it's not a one person project. And right? are you Somehow. planning on getting the magnetron off? Uh, <laughs> well, sure. I mean, uh, uh, it, this was the, this. Because I mean, uh, you have a large, you have two large magnets sitting. <laughs> there. Uh, you have you have a great heat source right there. Look. <laughs> you have a it's, lot of Lorentz actions going it's, it's on. It's a matter of money, right? So. Well, you just take it off. <laughs> sure. Get yourself get yourself uh, uh, a rectangular wave guide. Mm -hmm. And you can actually weld, you can actually do it yourself, weld, weld the wave glide together so mm -hmm. that you can shove the magnetron into one end, put a probe out of the other end, then take that coax and run the coax on over to your drive. Mm -hmm. and that way there you're eliminating that big <coughs> issue of thermal, the big issue of yeah. rents actions, you're locking the mode before you send the, the frequency up to the, to the uh, express drive. That way there, you're dealing with the known. Sure. This is all, this was, this, this was supposed to be the very next step to change the coax. Um, but again, I mean, the student graduated, right? And we said, okay, uh, can you stay for a PhD? And um, pff, it takes our time, right? Uh, you write funding applications. Some of the basic things that I would kind of recommend. Sure, yeah. Hmm? I think we have our Skyping guy. Ah, okay. Hi. <laughs> okay.